Englisch, weil die äh, Gäste äh, heute ja auch ähm, englischsprachig sind oder zumindest kein Deutsch verstehen, ähm, teilweise also ähm, ab jetzt auf Englisch. Ich bin Corinna Humuser, die Kuratorin der Reihe Other Europe. Um, dear audience, dear guests, I warm you, warmly welcome you to the Roma in Europe focus um, of the series Other Europe, Perspectives on Identity and Diversity, presented by Kampnagel together with the network Diplomats of Color. Um, from late September to December, the series highlights diasporic and minority perspectives on European culture, history and the present to override homogeneous constructions of identity. The Roma represent the largest ethnic minority in Europe. Their history is over 700 years old, yet this history is still barely visible in hege um, hegemonic narratives about Europe. However, the long struggle against the structural violence inflicted on uh, Roma communities, the fights of visibility and equal rights for recognition and remembrance of the extermination under no national socialism, and the lack of compensation afterwards are just as old and diverse as the groups, cultures, and traditions that gather under the term Roma. In this context, art spaces play an important role. First, because they have long been and still are part of the structural invisibility and discrimination. For example, stereotyping images of Roma have been constructed and reproduced in and through the arts. Secondly, because art spaces can be and have to be spaces, um, that support these fights and represent the diverse art productions from Roma perspectives. At Kampnagel, we are pleased to begin to focus on this topic now in the framework of the Other Europe series and to connect it to our long-standing enga engagement with questions of post- and decolonial decoloniality. But this should only be the very beginning because we see it as our responsibility to open our spaces and structures for marginalized groups and their fights as well as their artistic and discursive productions. I am therefore especially pleased to welcome our guests this evening, Angela Kosche um, and Giovanni Picker, um, and um, as a moderator, Anna Kokalanova. Uh, very warm welcome to all of you. I'm very excited to have you here. Mm -hmm. Um, I will um, introduce our guests um, now and then uh, follow with really brief organizational information. Um, we will start the evening, as I said, with a joint keynote by Angela Kosche and uh, Giovanni Picker on race, urban space and Romani politics. Angela Kosche is an assistant professor, chair of Romani studies and academic director of the Roma graduate preparation program at the Central European University in Budapest and Vienna. Until 2017, she was a, was a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies program at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She has published several peer-reviewed articles and book chapters with various international uh, presses, as well as several thematic policy papers related to social inclusion, gender equality, social justice, and civil society. In 2013, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. honored Koshche with um, the Ion Ratio Democracy Award for her interdiscipli interdisciplinary research approach um, which combines community engagement and policy making with in-depth participatory research and the situation of the Roma. She is a co-editor of the Romani Women's Movement, Struggles and Debates in Central and Eastern, and um, so that's the first book, the Romani Women's Movement, Struggles and Debates in Central and Eastern. Europe. Europe, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and the Roma and their struggle of identity in contemporary Europe. As you can see, Angela is a very important voice uh, with her intersectional research um, and activistic work in the field of Romani um, studies. Angela, I'm very happy to hear you speak today. Thank you for your important work and for your time and so thoughts this evening. And a very warm welcome. Thank you. Dr. Giovanni Picker is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Glasgow, UK. After obtaining his PhD in Urban Studies, he held a number of research positions in Russia, Hungary, Germany, and the UK. His current research and teachings, um, teachings center on the mutual articulations of urban studies and critical race studies, and empirically focus on Europe. 
He's the author of Racial Cities, Governance and the Segregation of Romani People in Urban Europe, co-editor of Racialized Labor in Romania, Spaces of Mar Marginality and the Periphery of Global Capitalism, and co-editor of European Cities, Modernity, Race and Colonialism. His work appeared in a wide range of academic journals and books, and he's now working on a monograph on urban planning and race in continental Europe. Giovanni is also coordinator of the Central and Eastern Europe and Russia of the Amsterdam-based um, Summer School on Black Europe, interrogating race, citizenship, and ethnic relations. Giovanni, thank you for engagement to speaking with Angela here today, and a very warm welcome to you as well. The Q&A that follows um, the keynote will be moderated by Anna Kokalanova. Um, Anna Kokalanova is an urban city planner and urban researcher and is currently a research associate at the Unis uh, Institute of Architecture and Urbanism at the Universität der Künste in Berlin. She researches uh, informal and temporary expressions and design practices of the city. Currently, she's working on her PhD thesis, Arrival Infrastructures, Spatial Practices of Bulgarian Roma in Berlin. Anna, uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate and come into Kampnagel uh, today, and a very warm welcome to you too. And dear guests, um, as I said, just a few organizational points at the end um, before we can listen to our wonderful speakers, Giovanni and Angela. Um, they will hold uh, the keynote via Zoom. Um, for about 30 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A, uh, or you know, a moderated discussion um, 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 with Anna and Angela and uh, Giovanni of 30 minutes. Um, and you can ask questions too, either here in the hall or via the phone number that you can uh, see at the video and below the, um, the video window if you watch the stream online. The number is... Um, German uh, phone number and then uh, 0177690425. We will um, um, also uh, um, tell you this number later again. And um, now I wish you all a very wonderful evening and leave the stage to Giovanni and Angela. Thank you. So why don't you start, Giovanni? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful for this invitation to Corinna and everyone else who was uh, uh, so uh, uh, so kind and and timely in in putting together this uh, this event. Uh, really, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, um, and I think. Um, um, we would like to um, organize this keynote in a in a in a dialogue more than in a sort of a, a solo uh, solo show. Um, so we prepared uh, some kind of questions for uh, to 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 ask to each other, and uh, I would like to start uh, with the, with a question to Angela. Um, so, Angela, you were born and raised in Hungary in a Romani family. How was your experience during state socialism? Um, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thanks for this really fantastic event, and we are really grateful for that. And um, and I just would like to add one thing to the Karina's Karina's uh, introduction that actually Roma are the uh, largest ethnic minority in Europe and many diaspora elsewhere in the world. And I think it's really important because in our analysis, usually we are so Eurocentric and we have to recognize that Roma are living in, even in America, Latin America and North America as well. But going back to your question, so I was um, raised in Hungary and in Eastern Hungary, as a, in a Romani family. So my, my father, my mother, they are Roma as well. And I'm coming from a very little village, which is called Kishpalad. And, um, and it's very close to the Ukrainian borderline. And I thought that I'm gonna bring some picture just to give you a, a sense that where is this village and how, how it looked, my community in the 50s and 60s. So I'm gonna share um my screen do you see it 
So, so that's the actually communities where I'm coming from. So I just digged in the archive and I found these pictures and and um, and figured out that actually the musicians it belong to my family. And here in the second picture, you can see this little girl. She's my mother. And um, so I'm coming from this kind of community and. Um, and also I wanted to show you another picture, which is still from the 50s. So you can see my mother here from a closer room. And, and this picture from the 60s, actually in front of the church, there is a priest and non-Roma, I mean, mainly non-Roma kids in the, in the back and, and they did their confirmation. And usually, you know, after the, this kind of ritual celebration, they came together to take a picture. And she is uh, one of my uh, actually um, nephew and um, how can I say, sis, not sister, aunt, 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 actually. She's my one of my aunt, oh, who is certainly Roma as well. And I brought some pictures from the 70s and 80s. And you see that, you know, uh, my aunties, they are elegantly dressed and, and they want to show that, you know, in their best dress. And this is the family, uh, you know, which belonged to me and my, um, you know, my, my, my uh, uncles who were playing on guitar, bass and, and violins. So I just wanted to um, give you this kind of, you know, um, sense that where I'm coming from. And basically, if you think about like in a sociological term, so it would be completely impossible, right, to sit here with you, although via Zoom, but still like I'm, I'm sitting somewhere, which is called university, right? And, and, and I went through this huge social mobilization, which is, um, um, not so um, evident in a Romani families, uh, even during the socialism as well. And, and if you think about like, you know, what happened during the state socialism, everybody thinks about assimilation, right? As a, as a, as a kind of ideology, which kept together the, 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 the East Central European countries and, and you know, the state socialist system based on the Soviet model. So not just Hungary, but in many other countries as well. And, and this kind of Soviet model, it's appeared to guarantee some kind of uh, equality to all citizens, right? So we would believe that, you know, everybody are equal and we are sharing the same kind of material, cultural resources. However, so various communities, particularly I'm talking about Roma communities or as they called in that time, gypsy communities, uh, generally lived under poorer conditions, right, um, than, than the average, uh, you know, um, standard of living of the non-Roma, the majority society. And this kind of material deprivation had a really strong effect on how society, you know, judged them, perceived them, and treated them under state socialism. And of course, like, you know, in the years after the Second World War and after the horrors of the Nazi death camps, um, Hungarian Roma or gypsies, as they call them, received no reparations and no apologies uh, for the genocide. In fact, I have to um, say here that, that Germany was the first country who, who, who basically recognized officially that they committed genocide against Roma. That was in, in 1982. So it's really quite late, right? And um, going back to the concept of assimilation, because I think that's, that's a really, really important thing when we are talking about socialism. 
And there is a very famous um, Hungarian political scientist called István Bibu, and, um, and who wrote the following about the failure of the assimilation of the Hungarian Jews, because they were mainly concentrating on anti-Semitism. And, and I'm quoting him. So Hungarian society from the very beginning assimilated or offered the opportunity to assimilate on this honorable, disrespectful terms. And, um, and, and I think this Bibo's observations is very much pertained to Roma as well, right? The Hungarian majority abstracted and um, the masses of self defined as Hungarian, socially marginalized and Hungarian speaking Roma from the opportunity to, to actually to integrate or we can call it to assimilate into the Hungarian society. So even though that they linguistically assimilated, but actually that didn't bring any kinds of social acceptance like I would like to refer to um, Rogers Brubaker, who is talking about that, you know, that, that, that um, social acceptance of the group is very important. And, um, and, um, and if, if they are facing with marginalization and exclusion, so that means that, that the social acceptance, it's never really, uh, realized in a in a Hungarian um, um, society under state socialism, even like economic success as well of Roma does not guarantee not just during state socialism but even today as well uh, a social acknowledgement as Brubaker is uh, talking about. Time is running. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I, absolutely. I I I think uh, you you. You, you said very very engaging things and and very and it's very interesting you you bring up you brought up the issue of assimilation because that was exactly the the kind of so you know communist policy policy and and soviet policy also in, in the ussr um assimilating minorities but it then and then you also talked about uh, social acceptance and the fact that uh, you know even today uh, social mobility uh, poor social mobility of roma do not guarantee social acceptance so how did it change uh, your experience uh, and and in general you know the roma experience in in hungary and central eastern europe during the 90s as uh, in comparison to the period before yeah i think i think it was a really uh, paradoxical changes, if I have to, you know, characterize it, and maybe just a little teaser from our book with um, Fambar, the Roma, and their struggle for identity in contemporary Europe, and and we we basically um, we we wrote a kind of overview about the last thirty years from the nineties, and interestingly, we find some some important reports, which was published in 1992 by the Helsinki Watch. Maybe some of you remember this. And, uh, and the report titled The Struggle for Ethnic Identity, Czechoslovakia's Endangered Gypsies. And it was a kind of successor uh, to two earlier reports, which was published in 1991 under the title Destroying Ethnic Identity on the position of Roma in the aftermath of the fall of communism in Bulgaria and Romania, respectively. And um, so just think about it, that these reports uh, were published um, almost 30 years, right? And, um, and these were the first international non-governmental report that started to talk about the, the, the struggles of Roma and uh, the violence and discrimination against Roma, particularly in the early 90s, and, uh, and also talking about, um, you know, that this kind of marginalized and excluded social position. And also important to think about that when we are talking about identity, it's not just as a subjective dimension, but really much as a social position, as a structural position, right? And, um, and also, 
it's important, it was important to compare that those issues which were mentioned at the very beginning of the 90s, actually it become relevant today as well. And in this day, just think about the, the emergence of extreme rights and this kind of rampant discriminations and violence against Roma and um, you know the, the structural racism and so on. But meanwhile, so why do I call it or we call it like as a paradoxical development? Because on an other hand, um, Romani movement has been developed into a, a kind of heterogeneous social movement, right? Because um, um, this kind of um, overriding concept of um, homogeneity of Roma has been challenged by scholars as well as by Romani activists. And, and they really entered into the sociopolitical and cultural scene and, and become an active agent of representation. So not merely as a, as a passive victims, right, of uh, representation and by others, rather, um, they, they start to talk and, and shape the policy discourses about trauma. And I think that's, that's a really, really important development. And, um, and also, consequently, Roma had now become more than a simply the subject of these courses, programs and tools of inclusion and anti-discrimination development, empowerment, participation and cultural and media production and consumption. Uh, but they are really a critical voices in debates about their status, about their identity, their history, memory, and, and more general, the representation as, as minorities. So they really try to influence the, the fabric of, um, of society as well as the discourse which has been developed about trauma. So therefore, I think it's, a, it's an important um, years in, in, in the history of Romani movement. Yeah, thanks. Um... So I, I see the paradox uh, very clearly that you 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 described, um, and uh, and and um, how would you how would you define as as a as an as an extension of these debates than the two thousand? So we talked about um, uh, socialism and and the kind of assimilation pro, uh, efforts. We talked about the nineties and these paradoxical changes, and how would you? How would you describe the 2000s? Did something change or something happened? What happened in the 2000s yeah, with regards think, to the Roma in Europe? Yeah, I think the 2000s were very important because the EU accession provided an important political leverage. Just think about the eastward EU accession, what happened in, in 2004, May, right? And, yep. and after that, 2007, I think Romania and Bulgaria as well joined to the European uh, Union. And, um, and we have been able to observe, you know, some interesting, um, uh, how can I say, <laughs> advantages and disadvantages and including migration from east towards west and um, and and as um, as as we can read from the human rights report that uh, many roma escaped from social malaise and and uh, increase their social mobility to support for relatives. And they were really looking for a, a better future for their, um, for their family. And, um, and yet many Roma who have been experienced a new life, you know, through migration have chosen uh, to hide their identity abroad in order to be able to navigate uh, this world. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, some of them, you know, were able to hide, but some of them were not able to hide. I mean, that's why it's so important, the perception that how people perceive you and, and how can treat you. 
and they have been confronted with um, exploitations, discrimination, exploitation, particularly in the labor and housing markets, and, and they did um, various jobs for uh, and they, they, they had to take those jobs. We were really um, uh, not paid well. And, and they were living in a high degrees of precariousness. At mm -hmm. the same time, those who for various reasons have not been able to hide their identities have often been faced with spectacular, right? Displacement, deportations, and spectacular violent removal through evictions. Even those who remained in their own countries, just think about the mortgages and um, you know, unavailable social flats or deportation. So it's a, it's a kind of you know, paradoxical development, which has been continued in the 2000s as well. And we could talk about some important um, uh, initiative by the um, European Union as well. Just think about the framework, the Roma, EU Roma framework um, from 2011 2000, until 2020. And now we have the new framework. And, and it had a very limited a positive impact in the living conditions of Roma. So if you can read the statistics, so the situation is even become worse, despite all kinds of initiatives, including the decade of Roma inclusion, we started in 2005 and, um, and lasted until 2015. So I, I, I would, um, you know, um, theorize it, very much similarly, um, uh, uh, which is, has been coined by Nancy Fraser, who, who talked about these years as a progressive neoliberalism. So on one hand, you know, we created some kind of allies with social movements such as and Roma movement, anti-racism, feminism, multiculturalism, LGBTQ rights, and so on, or disability rights, and um, on one side. And the other side, we are joined forces with, um, with financial capitalism, as she's talking about it, which basically um, 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 Gloss the, the the structural changes, the structural changes which further um, uh, marginalized and excluded Roma as well. And um, as Nancy Fraser refers to that, that you know, I ideals uh, has been articulated by progressive neoliberalism as diversity, empowerment, uh, which could in principle serve a really good um, you know, thing and serve a different end, uh, but it's glossed the, the structural changes such as the assault um, on social security. And, um, and as I told that uh, this kind of, um, uh, processes ultimately strengthen the exclusions and marginalizations of Roma in Europe. Yeah, I think this is uh, such a, uh, a very well synthesized uh, overview of the 2000s until today, uh, cutting across Roma policy, EU Roma policy within the framework of uh, diversity and unity in diversity of the EU so much celebrated and coming to a larger context about progressive uh, neoliberalism, which is, uh, includes a contradiction between uh, redistribution and recognition. On the one hand, there is a recognition of identities and different kinds of uh, multiple identities like multiculturalism, uh, identity-based kind of claims, uh, feminism, LGBTQ, and, and anti-racism. So there is a kind of recognition of these multiple and intersectional identity. On the other hand, uh, there is a kind of completely uh, unequal and, uh, and um, I would even say um, um, uh, 
plutocrat plutocratic and exploit exploitative and expropriating uh, notion of financial capitalism that uh, basically uh, uh, pushes more and more people to go into debt, that uh, doesn't uh, provide enough social housing, that cuts social welfare expenditure. And so those who are at the bottom of the social structure, they feel even more deprived today than they were probably before. Uh, so these contradictions, I think, are really, really interesting to, to observe. Um, I would like to 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 uh, propose a kind of a um, um, kind of a brief a brief um, um, a definition of this kind of a diversity paradox paradox. Okay, uh, and this unity in diversity uh, discourse that the European Union has so um, has so uh, uh, eloquently put together. Uh, just to to un sharing my slide here to underline one thing that I think is very important to, to understand, that uh, the, in the, at the European Union level, this discourse of diversity within which the Roma frameworks and, and, and Roma inclusion is always and, and uh, been framed, uh, misses, uh, uh, includes a lot of silences, and the issues of silences of these discourses is, is quite important. Uh, and I wanted just to mention here uh, a quote by Manuela Boatka's uh, um, book, Global Inequalities Beyond Occidentalism, in which uh, Boatka argues that the discursive construction of a singular notion of Europe does uh, depends upon silencing of, uh, the silencing of uh, the historical role of its member states and their predecessors in creating the main structures of global political and economic inequality. The member states of the European Union before its Eastern enlargement in 2004 were the same states that had exercised imperial rule over nearly half, and a, a half of the inhabitable surface of the globe outside Europe and whose colonial possessions covered almost half of the inhabited surface of the European world. So I guess when we often talk about Roma inclusion, we, we take for granted the fact that Europe is this kind of monolithical entity that is fine, it's just fine, and just Roma have to be included in this fine political polity, you know, political entity or economic entity, whereas Europe is being constantly constructed on the basis of silencing its colonial past. And this has, has um, consequences also for uh, the Roma inclusion kind of framework and, and Roma inclusion, understanding of Roma inclusion and understanding of Roma difference as well. So maybe here we could think about uh, coming to more um, to the second part of our dialogue about uh, what what have Roma done uh, uh, and what do they do uh, to unmask those these internal contradictions uh, of diversity and and and, uh, and 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 worsening social inc social conditions and recognition and redistribution as to kind of uh, uh, issues in, ten in tension with each other. So what did Roma do and what do they do in order to unmask these contradictions and take a voice? Yeah, um, uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just watching the time, it's 37 sure. already, uh, so we have to speed up. So there are several levels actually, what we can uh, talk about it and, and also there are several ways as Roma really unmask this kind of contradictions in Europe. So maybe one of the, uh, the important scene is the art scene. So what arts can do since we are talking about Roma in this really you know, artistic um, context. And therefore, I think it's really important to talk about um, um, what can um, arts offer to, to challenge the, the racialization of Roma. And, and I went back to one of the exhibition, what we did with my colleagues in the Gallery 8 in Hungary, Budapest. So maybe I can share with you my screen. Um, so it was called the Angela, Roma. Can Roma you enlarge? Can you enlarge the mm. slide? So it's it's. Uh... Sure. Um, 
uh, it's it's just there. No, yeah, okay. sorry. No problem, no problem. Um, yeah. Not from the beginning. Okay, do you see it now? Yes, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so basically it, it was a, an exhibition, but through this exhibition, we wanted to talk about the racialization and theorize what does it mean? How race has uh, is enacted at the moment of gaze and how this spectacular surveillance complicates social relations, and how it is historically embedded in European consciousness uh, by a popular culture. And, and also we pose the question that can the gaze be impartial or innocent? Never, right? Because we always projecting something on those people which are coming from our, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, what we read, what we heard, what, um, uh, what we learned in the school, and um, and 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 um, and we really thought that um, this kind of exhibition it really invokes feelings, thoughts, anxieties, right, and 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 challenge our conventional thinking. So if we're gonna see a Romani person like here, a very famous. Uh, Agnes Dorotzi, who is a Hungarian Romani activist and um, and a very key figure in the Hungarian Romani movement. So you would think that that she is this really um, old lady, right? Who's gonna cheat you and who's gonna trick you and will take an advantage on you and so on. So, it, and we can't see the person who is there, the humanity in them. So I'm just gonna roll on quickly. And Pasho um, um, and Katalin, also uh, a filmmaker, Romani filmmaker, sociologist, very important figure. You see that we contrasted her uh, portrait, like uh, we can project into her someone who is like an exotic dancer, right? The exotization is always there behind the picture. And, um, and the second and the next one is Julius Rostash, who was a former chair of Romani studies, who is a scholar, but you we see that again we see something behind that and the other really are high trope um what we are using it's a kind of exoticization criminalization right and again cheating treating us and um Tima Jung House again the ghetto girl and um um and Balog Rodrigo, who is a professional actor, and we can see him as a, as a gang guy, right? Anyway, so I'm gonna stop here, but the point what I wanted to say that body and racialized body, it really matters, right? The way as we see them and, uh, and we tied in their bodies into this kind of exoticization, uh, criminalization, sexualization, which really created the foundation of our knowledge about Roma. And, um, and also, I would like to point out actually that um, um, Stuart Hall, who argues that we have to pay attention not to the objective facts of the situation alone, but the stories, the culture spins for us about what the physicality, physically differences were are born with mean. This involves examining the discursive position. So I, I, I do agree with Stuart Hall that it's really important to, to examine the discursive position of Roma, which has been created by the cultural narratives. So yes, the gaze is not innocent, right? And the racialized body is really matter. And what we wanted to do to challenge this kind of conventional, you know, way of thinking, way of um, uh, talking about, uh, and way of seeing the Romani bodies. And I would like to refer to Marta 
Nussbaum verb, which is really important in this context. And, and, and she's putting an importance on, on the emotion in moral philosophy and, um, and posits that storytelling plays really a central role in expanding our empathy, and um, which is very much necessary for creating a just society. And what theater arts can do really improving our empathy and um, and, um, and, and challenging this kind of dehumanization, dehumanization of Roma, and, um, and uh, which really hiding uh, their humanity, their personality, and we see them as a disgusting people, right? And, and, um, and, 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 um, and creating a distance between ourselves and themselves. So arts, I really believe that um, um, has a power to change the dehumanization of Roma. And as Marta Nussbaum pointed out, actually that we have to defend arts and humanities and theater, the place where we are talking about Roma right now and racialization of Roma, it's really a kind of sacred space, right? Which can offer um, an opportunity to critically uh, reflect on, on our um, narratives and on our perception. And, and certainly academia, it's, um, it's another space and, and in academia talking about trauma and creating an interdisciplinary dialogues um, and, um, and see the situation of trauma um, as, a, as a larger social, political and economic processes. So I, I, I'm not really, uh, favor of essentialization and Zoom uh, on the community, rather connecting and relating to other global struggles, oppressions based on race, class, and genders. And um, yeah, so maybe. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think on this uh, really encouraging and, and uh, engaging note, we can start. Uh, 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 seeing if the public has any question, we can also we have also other slides of examples of Roma art uh, as 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 a, as a political intervention. Uh, uh, so, yeah, if anybody has any question and they want to raise, we'd be happy to answer. I guess Anna will come as well. Yeah, okay. Anna also. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Angela. It's a pleasure to be here, although I'm alone on the stage. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you in this digital or this hybrid space. Thank you for inspirational keynote. Um, we will continue with this conversation, and I'm really grateful that you started it as a conversation to show how many perspectives, how many histories, how many um, yeah, bodies are standing around this whole discourse. And I would love to encourage also the audience. We do have an audience, you cannot see it, but uh, we have around, I don't know, 20 people maybe. There is an audience here in the, um, in Kampnager, and we do have an audience probably online. I would encourage you also to ask questions because we are here for a reason. Everyone, every single one of us is here for a reason. As we heard, also silencing is part of our history and it's time to unlearn this history and it's part to break the silence. So please ask questions. You have also the um, dear audience uh, online has also this uh, mobile number 0177-6904295. You can send an SMS. It's a great time we're living in. You can send an SMS and this will reach us uh, here directly on the stage. So if you have questions, just raise your hands. Otherwise, I will start with a question that I have. I have a lot of questions. I'm sure we're not going to take all of them. Um, yeah, thank you. 
I would like to start actually where you said, Angela, um, about um, recognizing uh, Roma as victims of the genocide. It's uh, a topic that is again somehow on the agenda in Germany. There is the memorial, um, the memorial to the Sinti and Roma murdered under National Socialism. It was a decision in 1992, I think, in connection also to the arson attacks in Rostock that were um, against um, Romanian Roma who were refugees in Rostock in Eastern Germany at that time. There was a decision from the government to make a memorial for, uh, for the genocide. So this came again 10 years after the recognition of the, uh, of the genocide. Um, and then it took again 20 years until the inauguration of the memorial. In 2012 it was inaugurated. And now it is again under question uh, if it is really necessary to have it because there is a train line that is supposed to go under line. And so there was a kind of a discussion. So everyone says, no, we need it. But there was again a discussion and questioning, do we need this commemoration? Do we need this commemoration in this um, central space? Because it's next to the Reichstag, it's ne next to the parliament. It's very central. And I want to ask you if you if you can elaborate a little bit more on the practices of commemoration and how is it maybe also in other, um, in other contexts that, um, that you would know and refer to. Thanks. Well, I, I think it's, um, I mean, commemoration, the politics of memory, it's very important. And um, if you think about that, you know, Roma would like to be part of the, the, the commemoration, the politics of memory, right? And um, then I think somehow it has to be inscribed um, discursively, as well as, you know, we have to have some kind of physical manifestation of the commemoration. Maybe Giovanni can talk about the, you know, the relationship with space and what space can place, like commemorative place in a city as such um, in, 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 a, in a European context. And, um, and of course, it's, um, there is a, a, you know, contentious discussions around that, but I think that could be very productive. So um, how can we connect the, the past injustices and uh, extermination of Roma during the Holocaust with the present continuous uh, discrimination and violence, and and um, and sometimes this is a very uncomfortable and you know very contentious discussions. But I think it's really good that is going on, and that many Roma and non-Roma are as well taking place in this kind of discussions. So I think it's a it's a it's a very natural thing um, to have a, such, a, such a discussion. It's much better than the silence, right? What Giovanni was referring to that. Because even though that we are not talking about, but somehow um, that creates some, some kind of, you know, imprints on our narrative, the silence as well. So I think it's it's important to to create a, such a um, 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 commemoration space, erect. Um, I can't find the word in English. Um, memorial. Memorial. Thank you. And um, because it's it's constantly gonna remind us what happened in the history. Giovanni, what would you say, like in terms of space and yeah. uh, yeah. role well, of the cities in, in a city? Yeah. Maybe just also adding a little bit, because Giovanni, you're maybe the only one, I, it's the only one I know who uh, also connects the colonial past to the question of Roma. And it's, it's really valuable to also see it from this perspective. and when you go now to um, elaborating on the commemorial commemoration and the importance of space and the physicality, we have also this question of centrality. 
So it took actually 20 years because the community was not, uh, was not willing to say we're going somewhere on the margins of the city. Like there was this search for a space that is really in the center of Berlin. Maybe you can also elaborate on this question of centrality and uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there will be a lot of things to say about it. Uh, um, just one thing I want to say, but then I want to show one piece of art that I think is very relevant to this discussion. Uh, one thing to say is that it's absolutely necessary to have this monument, I think, this commemorative uh, uh, memorial, but it would be a mistake to think that this is sufficient because it is not sufficient to have a memorial. It is necessary, but not enough. We need to have concrete, concrete actions and concrete policies um, to, to, to improve the social conditions of not only the, the, the largest minority in Europe, but also one of the most, if not the most discriminated against and the poorest as mm -hmm. well. So I think that, that that's one point, but I would like to uh, briefly show you a, an art project that was, um, 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 made by Damian and uh, Delaine Lebas uh, from 2011 on. And as you can see from this slide, uh, the project is called Safe European Home, and it was, a, it was a, a, a different kinds of installation in the urban space of uh, different kinds of things. One is uh, the biggest photos you can see is, is, a, is a house, is a small house. Um, in which uh, uh, there are some writings and there is an exhibition inside of European minorities, especially the Roman Egyptians minorities, as they are called in, in, in the UK, the country where the artists come from. But also you can see on the right side that the, the, the installation was also displayed in front of the Austrian parliament. Mm -hmm. And so this is an act of occupying a very central public space, urban space in a space of power to, to express a kind of a, 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 an alternative imagination of what we want our cities to be and what we want Europe to be. A couple of other images, sorry, from this. This is Dresden, the same exhibition displayed in, 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 uh, in Dresden. Um, and so they, they toured Europe. This is again the, uh, the, the, the um, you know, Vienna, uh, but there is, a, there is a writing here that I want to highlight from this, uh, from this project. History repeats itself is the question here. And I think from this question we can, we can think about many things. But one of the things we can think about, and I, this is part of my work as well, but part of other people's work, is the fact that um, Europe has been colonized, colonizing, and that means it's been uh, sub, uh, subjecting and dominating for centuries, almost 500 years, um, uh, the others in other parts of the world. And now what is, what is happening today, as, as this data shows, uh, is that there is, a, there is a system of domination in place that has at its targets larger, large part of Romani communities across Europe. And so in this sense, I think here connections can be drawn between domination as it was conceived and experimented during colonialism in colonial cities, in colonial countries, colonized cities, colonized countries, and contemporary uh, uh, um, representations and actions vis-a-vis -vis larger parts of Romani communities, uh, 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 the majority, I would say, of Romani, of Romani people in Europe. And so here, uh, uh, the Le Bas couple is really uh, raising uh, awareness on this kind of uh, uh, risk to have history repeating itself. And this is one of the ways we can read this installation. Thank you. Maybe someone has a question from the audience. This is your chance. I mean, one in a lifetime. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I will continue. We still have a little bit of time. Um, yeah, there is so much to talk about. So. Um, Oh, maybe I'll jump to a kind of a last question that I had, but I can also switch back if it goes to. So you talked about the, the practices of resistance that are actually, it's nothing new. 
like they, they were always there and uh, probably at at some points they were not so visible as they are right now or uh, i don't know maybe they, we could talk about it how visible those practices are and how visible those practices of um, on an everyday level are also there because um, there are a lot of a lot of resistance practices it's not only in the arts in the academia in the theater in the museum they're like always on the streets and with the naming for example in bulgaria my background is bulgarian roma had were um, forced violently to uh, change their names with slavic names and there was like one man from the neighborhood where i, I did field work he chose the name Stalin, and this was the practice of resistance. He was like, okay, Stalin is a, is a name, but he was actually joking with this ridiculous, uh, violent um, act of the government towards them. And yeah, when we talk about these practices of resistance also, there is a lot going on right now. There is a lot of, um, a lot of visibility, probably not enough. Um, since 2008, I think it was 2008, Angela, maybe you know it better for sure. There is the Roma Pavilion at the Venice Biennial um, from the Mae Jung House, curated back then. And um, we have also the Roma Biennial, the Roma Archive. Uh, there is a lot going on in kind of bringing all these practices of artistic resistance, of social resistance together in one place. But I still do have the... Um, the kind of a feeling that it's it's a kind of a fragile moment. Um, I'm not so sure how how strong it is, and how uh, like it, it is still fragile. And I'm kind of asking you, what what can we do actually? What can we do to care for each other? What can we do to support each other? And um, yeah. What can we do to kind of take this energy that is coming now? Because there are a lot of people who are showing as, as Romani people, but also as artists, as mothers, as queer people, and are going in, um, on stage and breaking the silence. What can we do to support it and to care for each other and not to go into this neoliberal notion of you're, you're the one who is supposed to do it on your own? It's a question. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a huge question, but maybe actually we can think about the politics in these days in Europe, right? And um, and if you think about how Roma um, has been integrated by political parties, right? In um, in uh, various European countries, of course there are some. Right, so we have an MP in the European European Parliament, and and he's belonged to the German Green Parties, which is really great. We have um, Livia Yaroka um, from the Fidesz Party, conservative, um, right, right, and but um, but think about that how Roma has been. Uh, actually defined by the political discourse when, when Roma would like to claim their rights, their, their, uh, their equality in, in our societies. It's always labeled like as a, oh, it's a, it's, it's a politics of identity, right? So creating some kind of caricatures and referring back to Judith, Le uh, Judith uh, Butler, um, who was talking about that actually identity as such, as a single identity, ought not to be the foundation for politics. And, and she was referring to the importance of creating allies, coalition, and solidarity, which should be really the key terms as well as the key activities. So it's not just at the discursive level, but we have to do something in order to create solidarity, in order to create coalition and allies for those people who's been marginalized, excluded, racialized, and discriminated, who basically subject to some kind of systemic racism or 
as referring back to colonial, but even colonial subjugation, right? Because these kinds of oppressive mechanism certainly subjugating people. So what can we do? So when, um, you know, when, when, um, when Roma has no any other options, then, then they want to create their own political parties, because in some um, like uh, Western Balkan countries, you can see that kind of development as well. I would say that this is a reaction to the exclusivist and exclusionary mode of politics, right? So if Roma would be represented by the union, by the uh, by the feminists, by the LGBTQ movement, or whatever environmentalists, then then um, then we would not need a, such a single identity-based representation. And um, and and I really believe that we have to work across differences, and and we really have to build a very complex um, accounts of, uh, you know, social power and, and, and political uh, and, and mode of politics. And, um, and, um, and in order to do that, um, we have to, uh, you know, reclaim not just identity, but the rights of redistribution, right? Access to resources and um, and and um, and access to those kinds of material resources which has been denied um, from Roma. And um, why I brought up this kind of identity politics because it's really caricatured by the by the extreme rights and the rights, right? They love to say that you know this is only identity politics and and even some of the unfortunately left progressive as well. They are talking about identity politics instead of recognizing the 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 racial. Uh, injustice and the uh, and the gender inequality, which is so, so much embedded in our society. So I think we have a role actually redefining what justice, equality, and and freedom means, and how um, social and political movements can can fight for those peoples as well who are relegated to the margins of the society, who has been subjugated for centuries. So the redefinition is very important. Thank you. Giovanni, you already uh, kind of reacted to it <laughs> in a Zoom way. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, actually. And, and I'm really grateful that Angela is, uh, is putting these things on the floor, totally. on, the, on, the, on the table. Totally, thank you. Maybe uh, also a question for I kind of extended a little bit. Yeah, it's okay. Um, a question for you also when Angela is talking about um, the identity politics and then looking into the city, and there is still kind of a narrative that uh, Roma would need camps or they would need this kind of safe spaces. So that's why there are some fences also that we have in Europe around Roma neighborhoods. And um, even here in Hamburg, where we don't know it, probably a lot of us, but there is a, um, a, a Roma settlement for the family vice that was built in the 80s and it's very separated from all the other neighborhood around it and uh, still in Kiel, not far away from here, there is a new settlement that was built only for, for Roma quite uh, outside of the city after an industrial, um, industrial part of the city. So in a way, how do you how do you reflect on this notion of the, the camp or the, 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 the special safe space of Roma? <laughs> it's a big one, I know. <laughs> we have no, five minutes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I wish it was safe, you know. Um, yeah. As we have seen numerous times over the last 20 years and more, these settlements tend to be the target of racist attacks quite frequently. They are the opposite of being safe, actually. If you see a lot of settlements across Europe where Roma are pushed to leave um, or are given very few options uh, to, as alternative, uh, 
they usually lack basic infrastructures, uh, running water, electricity. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I would, I would challenge the discourse that present these sites as safe, as actually, uh, they are the opposite actually of safe. Uh, I, I would just mention the, the nomad, the so-called nomad camps in Italy that are really, really, really spaces of, of, of relegation and, and racial encapsulation and, and lack of freedom, as, as Angela was, uh, was mentioning freedom, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, and in Eastern Europe as well, I mean, I mean the, the so-called, not always very rigorously called Roma ghettos, actually, uh, they, they are in, in very, very bad material uh, infrastructural conditions, very dilapidated housing, and the abandonment of the state is, is overwhelming. So I think, I mean, this is a generalization. I think each city and each country has it, its own conditions, but, but I would challenge radically on the basis of empirical data uh, this narrative of having a safe space or having, well, I, I wish these spaces were safe, basically. Mm. Okay. I'm looking at the audience. Otherwise, um, I think regarding the time, it's, it's good to maybe continue with the next panel that is actually continuing this conversation. And I'm very happy that this is happening here um, in, in this space in Kampnagel. Thank you for for invite for hosting us here and for yeah putting this on the on the stage on the table and um, I think it's a lot that we have to continue with and it's a lot that we have to talk about and um, I wouldn't say it's a beginning but it is definitely we are somewhere in the middle and it's really necessary to continue talking thank you very much thank you thank you very much Ähm, ja, äh, die Gäste, liebe, ähm, liebes Publikum, wir ähm, machen um 20.30 Uhr ähm, weiter mit dem Panel über ähm, Intersektionalität ähm, mit Tayo ähm, Onutur, Maria Atanasova und Laszlo Falkas. Ähm, ich bitte Sie sehr, noch mal wiederzukommen. Ähm, holen Sie sich draußen kurz einen Drink, ähm, schnappen Sie frische Luft und dann ähm, geht es äh, um 20.30 Uhr weiter ähm, mit dem Thema ähm, Intersektionalität und äh, Roma-Kunst und ähm, Widerstand. Vielen Dank.